Good afternoon. We are so happy to be here for this session. But first, I want to tell you that this session is being played live on 96.3 Ohm Radio in the city of Charleston. So please, everyone, check your cell phones and make sure they're on silent. And welcome. First, I want to thank our sponsors for this session, Summer and Clyde Anderson, South Carolina Humanities, and Pat and Jim Moreno, and Deborah and William Kennard for their contribution to help students attend these sessions. I am so happy that I was able to participate in an innovative program this year with the Mayor's Book Club and the Charleston Literary Festival, and it was Charleston Reads. And we used Dr. Perry's book to read across Charleston. But not only did we read across Charleston, we connected with Oakwood University, my alma mater, because Dr. Perry's family is from Huntsville, where Oakwood is located, and she wrote almost a chapter on Oakwood and Huntsville. So Dr. Leslie Pollard, the president of Oakwood, is here. along with students, his communication students. Where are you students? Please stand. And their deans. So now I have an opportunity to introduce this, the speaker for this session, Dr. Amani Perry. She's an interdisciplinary scholar of race, law, literature, and African-American culture. She is currently the Hughes Rogers Professor of African-American Studies at Princeton University. Dr. Perry's South to America, A Journey Below the Mason-Dixon Line to Understand the Soul of a Nation is a physical and intellectual travelogue, and I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to hearing from her. And the moderator is Dr. Tamara Butler. She's the executive director of the Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture, and also the associate dean of strategic planning and community engagement at the College of Charleston Libraries as an assistant professor of critical literacies at Michigan State University, Tamara returned to her South Carolina Sea Island community to continue research connected to her Black Girl Land project, which focuses on documenting black women's connections to land, memory, and community. Join me in welcoming them all. Hello, everyone. Oh, I'm glad I didn't say anything earlier. I was like, this is a hot mic that I'm sitting on. So I want to welcome you all to tonight's conversation. Um, I'm very grateful to Charleston uh, Literary Festival for including me in this session. Uh, deep down inside, I don't think Dr. Perry knows this, but I'm fangirling just a little bit. Um, because I, every, any student that came through my, my doors knew um, and read Bexy Thing. So they had, there was a book that I had to recommend. I think there's probably a student even here um, somewhere who had to read Bexy Thing. So. Um, and she's an author of several books. So we're going to get into this first one. So thank you for being here. No, oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm so delighted to be here. Yay. Okay. All right. So I'm going to kick it off with one question that will get us jumping into the book. OK. Um, and so I'm a visual person. So I'm really curious. Can you tell us a little bit about the cover art for South to America? Yes. So here's, it was a bit of kismet, which happened a lot while I was working on the book. So 
we discussed several covers. Um, and the cover is a piece by Sonia Clark, who's a sort of brilliant conceptual visual artist, mm -hmm. who I know. Okay. And as I was working on the book, I actually went to see, she had two exhibitions up in Philadelphia. I live in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And there's two up, and one is, um, it was this kind of extraordinary uh, project about flags, right? She does all these projects about Confederate flags and U.S. flags, and so I went there. It was beautiful, the fabric, uh, fabric workshop in Philadelphia. And she had a bunch of books that she sort of recommend people read mm -hmm. related to the exhibition. And one of them was my book, May We Forever Stand, A History of the Black National Anthem. So I'm, you know, all emotional <laughs> and the like. And then I go to her other exhibition, which is at the African American Museum. And she, among the things that are part of that exhibition is she has, um, like, I, I'm trying to describe it correctly, but it's like a, a, like a player piano that is playing, lift every voice and sing, with, with hair as parts of strings, and there's a group of school children there who were like itty bitty kids, five and six, and they're singing along with it, just on a tour, right? And so I'm all emotional, because I've written it, I spent years writing about this right. song. Okay, so all that happens, and then my editor is like, what about a cover art, from, a piece of cover art from Sonia Clark? And I was like, of course, right? But it was, it happened over and over again that there'd be these sort of moments where everything came together mm -hmm. and it felt really sort of spiritually profound. So that's, that's sort of my story about, and she, you know, she just, she's always doing really profound things with history and culture and identity and, and what it means to be here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, I love that. Thank you. I was looking at it, and we I had some students looking at it. I was like, what do you see on this cover? And they were like, is that hair? Yeah. I was like, yes, I think so. So I was like, let's ask Dr. Perry about this cover art. Hair, cotton. Cotton. Yeah. It's, it's all of it. And so I love the fact that it also ties in some things that I really love about your book, is this idea of our connection and black people's connection to land, mm -hmm. um, especially in the South. So like Ravi Howard writes in Camille Dungy's book that we're so far removed, or people like to tell us that African-Americans are so far removed from oaks, rivers, and low country. Um, but in your book, we see a whole different side of that. So um, in one of those conversations, I looked at a lot, I listened to a lot of conversations. I did a deep dive with Dr. Perry. Um, so one of the conversations was with your colleague, Eddie Glau. Yes. Um, and one of it, you said that the argument of your book was to push against this idea that the South was just a repository for the, na for the nation's sins. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us a little bit more about like, how are you thinking about blackness connected to land, but also us reimagining the South? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. I mean, I, you know, for me, one of the questions, one of the ways that I, one of the things I push against is I think the story that we generally get conventionally of black people in this country today is, mm -hmm. there was slavery, slavery was bad, then there was Jim Crow, then all the black people left in the Great Migration, mm -hmm. but then somehow there were still some black people down south to have the Civil Rights Movement, mm -hmm. and then everybody else is up north again, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> That's it. <laughs> right? and, and as opposed to the reality is that the majority of black people have always lived in the south in this country. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the question is, we've had beautiful work about why people left, I'm interested in why people stayed. Mm -hmm. And part of that is, does have to do with the relationship with the land, mm -hmm. with, an, with the ancestral land, mm -hmm. with how much of our blood, sweat, and tears is in the land, with what it means to be bound to the land, but also to imagine differently what our relationship with it might be. Mm -hmm. I know you know. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so... Um, you know, and this is why, you know, we always, we talk, we talk about the red clay. Yeah, yeah. Right? And we t I mean, that there's, and there is something about walking the paths where we know our ancestors were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the trees that are older. Yeah. Right? Than, than, than any of us. I mean, the trees that were here before all of us and will be here long after mm -hmm. we're gone. And so, um, there's a, there is a, a spiritual repository that is part of the source of freedom, dreams, and resilience, mm -hmm. that notwithstanding the violence that, is so, that has been part 
of, um, for black people in particular, mm -hmm. you know, uh, how our story here and our relationship with, with the land that is also part of, you know, why we're still here and how we're still imagining how to get free. And so yeah. I, yeah, I think it's important to tell that story. It's so important. I love this. You said freedom dreams, and it made me remember you said that the greatest free freedom dreams and freedom dreamers come from the South. Of course. Who are some of your favorite um, or most uh, oh. memorable or loved freedom dreamers? Oh, my grandmother. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, who as so who I think about every single day, mm -hmm. um, who is the person I came home from the hospital to when I was born. My mother was had a very difficult uh, uh, birth and was stayed in the hospital and raised twelve children. Jim Crow, Alabama sent them all to college, mm -hmm. clean people's houses for a living yeah. before working in the hospital later, and who had no limit on the imagination she had for any of us, right? Um, is the person who I saw reading every day. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's, you know, she's the, at the center, you know, so the freedom dream in the sense of, you know, it's not, not, a, not an organizer, not an activist, mm -hmm. but someone who just had the kind of imagination for all of us that has animated every aspect of my life. Everything that I do, I, I try to model her integrity, but I think about what she might have done had the world been different. And I try to sort of live out some of those things. Mm. Um, Ella Baker, yeah. of course. Miss Baker, when, um, when, I, when I knew her, she uh, had, um, you know, the, it was the end stages of her life and had dementia. And at times, Bob Moses, who was, who was the, the, the organizer from SNCC, was the architect of, of Freedom Summer, used to have me come by. And he used to come take Miss Baker to the park. And so I would take her to the park and sit on the bench with her. And I, as a child, I understood that that was a, a sign of a sense of, a very traditional sense of responsibility. You know, little black girls are expected to tend to people. Mm -hmm. Um, but that that was the responsibility was even heightened because she was so important for our, all of our freedom, yeah. you know. And so yeah, so so people, of course, Fannie Lou Hamer. I mean, it's, I mean, it's it's so many. But I I really wanna I wanted to backtrack and thank you for thinking about your grandmother um, and letting her guide you through this project thank you. Um, and sharing her with us. And so I just wanted to say thank you for that. Thank you. As a writer, you also give a lot of. Um, folks a different kind of hope for how to write, right? Because mm -hmm. I think so often um, academics are taught that you have to cite this person, you know, this scholar only and this scholar only, but you have managed to find a way to weave the everyday mm. person into part of the story, mm -hmm. right? As not just part of the story, but as you said, as central to the story. And so I want to thank you for- Oh, thank you. Giving thank us permission you. to do that. <laughs> That's the dream, you know? <laughs> and so one of my questions, I'm going back, I'm going to borrow a lot of questions from Eddie, right? So, okay. one of the, so I'm going to borrow, because he asked the question, I was like, man, I really wish he would answer that question. Um, of, so he said, you know, what does it take in order for us to tell the story of how we got here, right? That was one of the questions. But I want to flip the question and say, what is required? So as a storyteller, you offer us a whole new method Right, and sometimes it's disorienting, and sometimes it's like, yeah. wait a minute, how did we get back to, <laughs> we were just in, you know, Dr. Evans' house, and now we're <laughs> over here on a post postcard, and we're at this place, so I just asked this question of like, what is required to tell the story? Like, mm -hmm. how do we tell the story of how we got here? What do you think it took? What did it look like for you to write yeah. the story? It, well, I say one thing that is absolutely required is that I could not write a conventional academic book. Mm -hmm. in the sense that um, there's a piece of the story that is very dependent upon research, traditional research, right? Like historical research, um, looking through documents and data. Mm -hmm. right? And then there's the piece that is um, uh, what I've described in other work is cat trying to catch a feeling of something, mm -hmm. right? That has to do with familiarity and love and repetition and what you know and the quiet, the silences, but that if you are familiar with the place that you can read. Mm -hmm. And so I knew I had to be able, 
that was so important to this story that I couldn't write in a way that, where that would be misfitted. Mm -hmm. So for me, the way to tell the story is, I, I'm, okay, I'm gonna physically walk. I had so many maps. I had, had old-fashioned atlases that I used for writing this book. I have tons of them, right? Mm -hmm. And I just go through all of these atlases. And I would say, okay, well, if I'm here, right, if I walk down this road, what are all the things that I'm going to find on this road, right? Mm -hmm. And with atlases, there's layered history, right? So that's a little, that's a little insider, <laughs> um, you know. So I know what was there before. So then it, it gave me an access point. So if I have an encounter with somebody, and inevitably, because part of the reason I love being in the South is because people will talk to you, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> And so, you know, and I'm, and I try, I'm shy, but I love one-on-one, -on -one, right? So, like, so I'm, I'm happy when people will talk to me. But you also know, because we tend to have um, elliptical conversations, so you yeah. know there's some topics that are going to keep coming up, right? right? Yeah. So it's a good setup for writing a book, right? <laughs> because you know there's some things that are going to come to the conversation, right? Right. And then that is an entry point to telling history, right? And it, so it's, the book reads as like associative, like I'm jumping here, I'm jumping here, there, but it's always sort of pre-planned mm. as an architecture to let you get to the like heart and soul of the interaction and then underneath the ground mm. where I am, right? And I think that that's how we have to tell the story, mm -hmm. right? Because it is a complicated story about global history, politics, power, the production of wealth, mm -hmm. disenfranchisement, resilience, love, land, and, 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 and the beauty of the landscape. Yeah. All of those yeah. things have to be in it, right? And mm -hmm. so you can't, like, you know, if I tried to tell that in a conventional narrative, people would be bored. Yeah. Right? First, I'm going to tell you what happened in this year, and then they had, you know, this crop, and then this, it doesn't, you know, you ha so you have to, like, kind of mix it up. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciated that. I mean, I think there's a moment in the book where I feel like, uh, like it feels, I feel very science fiction-y, and kind of like I'm doing a little time jump yeah. every now and then, so I appreciate it. I appreciate it. It felt almost like maybe double dutch. Like there was a, you could yeah. take oh, in I'm and out. So I appreciate that. That's a, you can take that one. I you. love that. <laughs> Because I was thinking quilting, but double dutch is a much better metaphor. I mean, because there's parts of the books that you really do jump in. You're into jump, a place yeah. and you jump out. And so take turns. And here's the secret. Okay. Because I can't jump double. And part of the reason I can't jump double is because, you know, if you swing double-handed, you can't, you don't get turns to jump. And so I'm not a very good, this is, a, this is obviously an 11-year-old trauma. Gotcha. But since I can't swing very well, so I'm not good. So I love the metaphor because it makes me feel like I have now learned to jump. Yes, you, that's it. You're the double dutch of, of the word. Yeah. So I appreciate it. I think my next question is going to be asking a little bit about, since you talked about atlases, how did you choose your places, your locations? Yeah. So um, I tried to choose locations uh, well, I'll say first, strategically to capture the different um, Souths, plural, mm -hmm. um, which had a lot to do with different industries in different locations, right? So I wanted to, you know, so, so mining and where, you know, tobacco and indigo, cotton, right? Like mm -hmm. those types of, and then, um, you know, steel mills and, um, and, also, and also tourism, right? Mm -hmm. So that was, that was part of it. Um, and then there's diff the different, and layered onto that different languages and uh, sort of cultural distinctions. And also I was thinking a lot about roads. Mm -hmm. Now, roads fell out because of COVID, because there were some drives that I was going to take that I couldn't take. Okay. So like, so for example, I mean, I don't even, I don't have to show this hand, I'm gonna show it, but I was okay. going to re, I, I hadn't driven out I-10 for a very, very long time. So I was going to go out I-10 again. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, and you know, it was this 20, 65, like I had a whole sort of <laughs> like, you know, map of, of driving that was also going to have as part of the motif, the highway programs and, and what happened to black communities and the like. So that fell out. Okay. Right? So, you know, so, but part of what happened that was good is that in, you know, complicated, but good is that um, because of some places I couldn't go to and it dropped out, I actually then wound up relying on memory in different mm. ways. 
And one of the things, I don't know if other people experienced this, but in the context of COVID, memory was very strange. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, I would start to have these floods of very vivid memories mm. of people and places that I had experienced, I think because of the complete isolation. Mm -hmm. And so some of that actually wound up much more in the book than was previously planned, which I actually wound up liking. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, we like it too. Thank uh, you. It's a New York Times bestseller, right? So it's just, <laughs> just, you know, just saying. Somebody loves it. Somebody liked it. Somebody loves it. So one of the things, so you brought up the side, you said South. Yes. So I'm going to go back to that because I remember you, I remember hearing you say in a conversation, there are Easter eggs. And so I was like, I feel like that was an Easter egg. Yeah. Uh, let's go back and talk about South, right? How are you defining South? What is South? Uh, you include some places that I don't think people usually think of as the South. Right. So how did you go about conceptualizing South for this book? Right. So I will say, <laughs> here's a little, uh, here's, my mother's going to be so disgusted with me, but I'm going to tell the story. <laughs> so she said, um, we were having a conversation while I was writing and we were talking about Mitch McConnell. Mm. And she said, um, and she said, where is he from? And I said, isn't he from um, Kentucky? Like, where? And she said, no, he's from the South. Right. And, right. So, I, so I say that as a way of saying something about a certain kind of Alabama bias about what constitutes the South, right? If you refer to North Carolina's upstate, mm -hmm. that's it, you know, and, and so, uh, right, he's, and we, well, Mitch McConnell's from Alabama, but anyway. Oh. Um, but the point being, and it's, you know, is that I was actually trying to, as I was writing, to challenge myself mm. in what I meant um, in a lot of different ways. So, so one was this, this part of why I started in Appalachia is, is because it's like this is not a place that is familiar to me in the way that Deep South locations are. Mm. I also was challenging myself because as much as, um, you know, Alabama's familiar, Mississippi, it, it, the Black Belt is not familiar to me, mm. right? Even though when we say the South as a sort of metaphor, as a symbol, that's usually what people mean. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to think about, you know, what does it mean to actually like go to the Black Belt with some humility, mm. right? And to be aware of that, which I don't know about what living in this place is, mm. right? And so... So for me, the journey of South Plural was about both challenging my own assumptions, um, but I did stop myself. Like, for example, um, you know, there are people who consider St. Louis the South, right? So, I, you know, I didn't go there. I right. mean, I went there a bunch of times, right. but I didn't write about it, <laughs> right? So, um, but yeah, trying to sort of, and, and even that idea of like what co people have those ideas based upon ideas about what living in the South means that is mm -hmm. often set against the dominant narrative of the country, which yeah. so often pushes the South to the side, right? So, mm. so it's a defensiveness that is born of a kind of dismissiveness that is deep because the country couldn't function without the South, never could have from the outset, right? DC is where it is because of the Revolutionary War debt, right? New England couldn't pay for that, the, for, the, for the debt. No. So the Virginia planter said, um, no, no, we need, we need, we need the, the capital near us. And they could pay for it because of all the unfree labor, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, so that's, um, so that's why it's just trying to tell that story with some texture and a little humor. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you do really well with the metaphors. The one that sticks out to me, and then we're going to get to another question. Yeah. Do you, does it ever bother you when people read your book? Like, read it out loud? No. no. I mean, it's fine. Okay. I can hear everything that's wrong with it, but no, that's okay. No, uh, that's not why I'm doing this. <laughs> so, in the chapter on Florida, mm. I'm really interested about orchids. Like, the orchid thing threw me. And so, um, you write, uh, others made their way into the Florida wetlands. In those wetlands, orchids grow wild, pink and white on tree limbs, feeding off of the landscape without being parasitic. They're more beautiful that way, lighting upon the sight line in an environment that feels like it's weighting your limbs as you make your way through. Mm -hmm. um, and then you go on to talk about alligators and water buffalo and, man and manner of birds. Orchids are native to Florida, but you'll hardly know as they've been rendered so exotic in our popular culture as to be wholly unfamiliar to us. 
how did you make that? How did, how did we get to orchids? Like of all the things <laughs> in the wetlands, because that line, I was like, I was like, I love orchids. I can't grow one, right? But just this, you yeah. took, that, that also started to enter into it's a conversation. So right, yeah. It's a, so, see, you're good. You, <laughs> you're, you are very attentive. Um, yeah, because it's, for me, it's the metaphor, mm -hmm. right? The, I mean, once, if having seen a wild mm -hmm. orchids and I thought, no one would ever think this is a southern flower, mm. right? And it's so representative of the dismissal and the disregard of the sort of these in incredible beauty and abundance and the kind of the cost of the caricature, mm. right? So, um, so for me, it was, I was like, yes, this is, I mean, this is, but, it, but there's another layer to it yes. with Florida because that's, that's a piece, right, of it that is represented, this sort of what, it's, it's a little, it's, it's a couple of paragraphs that are supposed to do some of the work of the whole book, but then there's also this characterization of Florida is not the South. Right. Says who? Right. Right. It absolutely is. <laughs> right? Yep. And so that's also part of the argument of the Florida chapter, right? Mm -hmm. And what is the investment in saying that it's not the South is the mm -hmm. question, mm -hmm. right? And the investment in saying it's not the South has everything to, now, now okay, I will say that. <laughs> It is. I have learned that. Right. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> like it's not. But the investment, I think, is, is, is because people want to partake in Florida as a tourist destination without thinking about its history and its ongoing legacies of that history. Right. Right. So if I want to talk about, you know, no, no, but this is you, Disney World where that is, that's, that was the lynching capital. Mm. of the country at one point, mm -mm. right? People don't want, right? Yeah. Right. And so, you know, so for me, but also even a place like Miami, which is international and yet has the same racial logics mm -hmm. of the rest of the South, because those are the racial logics of the South, of the South of the racial logics of the Caribbean, mm -hmm. right? So we're all dealing, you know, these legacies are layered. And so, um, yeah, so that was yeah. nice. Thank you. Sorry, that was my favorite. I was like, I love, I love anything with plants. And so every time you made a reference, I was like, got to bark that page. Me Thanks. Too. Yeah. But you okay. said Caribbean. Yeah. So why do we end there? Why is that, why is that the, where we go? See, I'm so glad you asked that question because people don't ask <laughs> that question. Um, because, and I think it's really important because when we talk about the beginning of this country, right? And we, we can, there's lots of debates, right? 1776, 1619, I'm inclined to think about 1500 because I want to include Florida. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the story is one of, the European, of European explorers jockeying from different empires, trying to use this land to expand their empires, to take advantage of the abundance here, and then what happens in that encounter with indigenous people, with African labor. Um, that story, is important from the beginning because the ways of being, and this is the, you know, the big underlying argument, the ways of being in relationship to each other, the way in which um, heartbreakingly innovation is tied to exploitation in this, mm -hmm. in this culture, it, it, it starts there, right? Mm -hmm. So that the Caribbean and the Southern United States, that was the same region. Mm -hmm. Those were not, the, the distinctions that are drawn are more recent political history, but they, they were settled for the same purposes and, and bear so much, and it's, I mean, in South Carolina, this is more apparent because of the relationship between Barbados and South Carolina. There's less, part of the reason I wanted to talk about the Bahamas is that there's less attention to how much of the Bahamas was settled by people from South mm -hmm. Carolina, right? And this intersection of people from South Carolina and Haiti that happens there, you know, I, I, so it started with me just, I, first time I went to the Bahamas, I was like, how, why do they eat grits for breakfast? <laughs> I, I just was so puzzled, right? I was like, how did this happen? Yeah. And then, you know, it becomes this path of discovery and you just see, um, I think there's something so precious about unearthing, um, you know, 
these, these roots of connection, mm -hmm. these sort of submerged histories. I think it helps us um, be more empathetic and decent, right? It mm -hmm. brings us, I, I think that brings us closer to the possibility of living in the mm -hmm. beloved community, mm -hmm. but it also opens up conversations. Maybe we should tell the story of who we are differently. Mm -hmm. what, if we, what are the different ways we could tell the story? I think, I believe, I'm a person who believes that history has uses and the most important use is to actually imagine how we want to be in the present and future um, in ways that are decent and kind and just. And so I want to look for historical stories that help us be better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love that answer. Thank you. Well, you said South Carolina and you said Bahamas, because that was actually going to be my next question. I was going to ask, so you decided to start this chapter and name the chapter, well, A is the Low Country. But then it's also home of flying Africans. Yeah. Um, so I, the first person that came to my mind when I read that chapter is Ms. Ruth Retired Rambo, who always said, she would correct me. She was like, no, we are the descendants of the amazing Africans. Ooh. Right? Like, I would say something, she'd be like, amazing Africans. I was like, all right, got you. Got I you, like Rambo. that. Um, so thinking about this idea of why would you want to start, you started that chapter there. How do we carry the flying Africans with us through that chapter? Or how do they inform that chapter for you? So I will say they, they inform the chapter, but they inform, um, hmm, they inform, and this is very personal, identity for me, okay. right? This is Virginia Hamilton's The People Could Fly is one of the most important books from my childhood. Mm -hmm. um, and, Part of the reason it was so important is that there wasn't much, you know, so I was born in 1972. Um, there were books about, there was a sort of small growing body of books that sort of were, connect, were to connect African Americans with the West African heritage, but there wasn't much about what it meant for us to be descent, descended from Africans. You know, this sort of this sense of a, a connection that was active and, contemplating what it meant to, to, to come here mm -hmm. and then to survive, mm -hmm. but also to try to hold on. Um, and so, so the, I mean, so in some ways, so that's the heart of it. Is that I, and, and, you know, for those of you who haven't gotten to the end of the book, part of this, it is really important as a through line mm -hmm. that Africa remains here. Mm -hmm. Right? This is, you know, so we're, we're very clear. I mean, we're in... We're in Charleston, so people know that right. here, right? It's, a, this, it's a different thing to say than some places, but um, in, throughout the country, you know, Great Britain is very clear, right? Um, some of you are in the Southwest, you know, the history of Span, but it's also, this is a place that is so indelibly shaped by African people, past and present, mm -hmm. sensibilities, aesthetics, um, and particularly to the extent that I'm talking about freedom dreams mm. of all sorts, right? I don't know if, any, if anybody has seen this sort of stunning documentary on the history of country music, um, that six part series, but it, part of what's so beautiful about it is that it, it, it talks about that, yeah. right? The freedom dreams are not, are they black folks freedom dreams, but they're actually freedom dreams period, right? right? That right. actually that had this sort of um, that breathed life into anybody who was trying to imagine a different kind of way of being in this country and this history. So, yeah, so. Well, I'll take it. Okay. I was going to say, because there's also a, a question that rose in my mind is, so if you, for those of you who haven't gotten to the Low Country chapter, it's a little bit of a spoiler alert. We oh. take a drive. Oh, right? yes. So we go for a drive. Oh. Yeah, we take, oh, a, that, we, take yes. a drive, we take a drive down some streets, and we end up in front of Emmanuel, Mother Emanuel, right? And we are looking at and Liberty Square. Where would you want to continue? If you were to grow, the, to take that chapter forward, is there any place else that you would want people to, to land in Charleston if they were to keep going? Oh, I don't know. Where, well, um, let me ask you. Sure. I don't know. I mean, I, th I think about, I thought about it because I was like, there's a trek, there in that chapter and reading it, I was like, there's a journey from Charleston. There's like, there's Ebo, I, there's Ebo Landon, Landon yeah. right? There's Buford, there's Savannah, there's Charleston. And I was like, well, where will we go next? 
right, if we're thinking about the low country and just thinking about flying Africans, I was like, there's so many sea islands. So you go to the island, yeah. Right. Or just, I was just, I was just curious of like, where would we, where Simon? would we? Simon? Yeah. Yeah, where, yeah, St. Helena's, which is really, um, yeah. Barbados. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, you talked That's about... a great question. Yeah. I mean, you talked about VC, talk about Denmark, VZ, and, uh, and how children yeah. possibly went to Cuba, right? And so just thinking about this idea of, like, where, if we were to bring back in this concept of flying Africans, you get, you put, they come, they land in front of Mother Emanuel, where would they go next, right? Where else could we, if we were to take flight with them, where else could we go through this book, right, through this chapter. So, he, okay, so this is a little bit off topic, but it made, okay. what you said just made me think about it. So, you all know the story of Eliza Pinckney, who is this sort of indigo um, young, wom young woman, owner of a plantation who sort of made indigo prosperous for the first time in South Carolina. So I've been researching her because I'm writing about um, indigo, among other things, right now. And there's this little bit of the story that is not told in any of the official stories, which is, you know, she was really struggling to grow indigo. Okay. And, um, and, you know, and the stories tend to submerge all of the black people who are actually doing the work, but we'll, let's set that aside for mm -hmm. a minute. But, yep. and so at some point, she, she brings in an overseer from a plantation, um, I can't remember where exactly, and he actually deliberately messes up the crop because he doesn't want to mess up, he, he doesn't want competition. I think, oh. the, I think Montserrat. And then they bring in a, uh, a, an enslaved, uh, they describe him as a, as a, as a black man from um, the French West Indies, mm -hmm. right? And he comes in and he teaches her how to, how to grow indigo. Mm -hmm. And I'm fascinated by this because it, we don't know which island. We don't know Martinique, Guadeloupe, Saint-Domingue. It doesn't specify. He has no name, right? And, but there... So part of, when you said that, I thought, I want somebody to take me and show me who he was, right? <laughs> yeah. And because part of the thing, you know, this ongoing question is what do we do with the names we don't have mm. and the stories we don't have? And I'm really trying to ask that as a, as a philosophical question, mm. not just as a, as a site of grief, yeah. but actually how do we think about that, right? That there, that there is a way to honor those who, 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 who go unnamed and that, that I think we have to be deliberate about it, so... Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So I can keep asking questions, but I feel like people have questions. And so I do want to, if we have audience members who have questions, you can, we see, I saw a hand, and I'm going to try my best okay. to repeat the question. There might be, oh, there's Mike. There we go. Is it Mike? It's a Mike. Thank you for this book. <laughs> Oh. But I want to read a passage in your last chapter, right before the conclusion. I'd like to get your response on. <laughs> Dreaming isn't dead, and I'm going to skip a couple lines. I believe writing can be moral, a moral instrument if it asks you to do more than read. How many times will you witness people being starved or worked to death, driven out of their homelands, Moving on, when will you finally be repulsed enough to throw a wrench in the works? When will you allow curiosity and integrity to tip over into urgency? I'm asking you, I'm asking myself to dig deep enough for the truth to flood in. Let's sing those blues. And then in the margin I put, let's mourn. And then I thought about a raisin in the sun and the scene involving Benita and Lena when Lena asked Benita, have you cried for Walter? And so my question is, one, did you have that in mind? And two, who, are you, who is to you in what you're writing here in terms of mourning? Yeah. And we know that there's a gloriousness in the morning because joy comes in the morning. Uh -huh. And I'm not talking about M-O-R-N, but M-O-U-R-N. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Joy comes in the morning. Yes. Oh, I thank like you. Um, so my, my, my mother used to talk about what it meant, um, to have an eschatology of heaven on earth. So the idea of joy coming in the morning being an imperative for us to actually make 
you know, to, to create different kinds of mornings, right? Um, absolutely, I wrote a biography of Lorraine Hansberry for folks who don't know, looking Ooh. for Lorraine, and that is, if, if Hansberry had a theology, that was hers too, right? Um, there's a scene in A Raisin in the Sun where, uh, you know, there's several scenes where Benita, who is the, 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 the young, sort of politically strident, aspirational, you know, doctor, want to, aspir aspiring to be a doctor, young woman who is in some ways an avatar for Lorraine herself, where she, in her hubris, is, you know, kind of rejects her mother's spirituality and, and dismisses her brother's desperation to try to make a meaningful life for himself. And her mother is, is, is you know, holding her feet to the fire. And there's something that Lorraine wanted us to understand about what it means to care for the people that is not a matter of the intellectual work, but the spirit work. Right, and so yes, in the sense that I don't know that when I was writing that I was thinking explicitly, but I'm always trying to think alongside her to try to think alongside. I, I, describe, I think of myself, I often describe myself as a keeper of tradition as part of the mm -hmm. tradition I'm trying to hold on to. What does it mean to hold, you know, to, um, to study and to feel simultaneously and to believe that, you know, another way as possible um, that, isn't, that isn't just a cerebral matter, you know, that is a matter of soul and spirit, right? Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. We have, a, we have two questions. We got, well, three questions. We got one in the back, one in the front, one on the left. Yes. Uh, um, I've spent about 12 years trying to read Southern history to understand this place where I moved 12 years ago. And I, right before I read your book, I read Tony Hurwitz's Spying on the South, which mm -hmm. you refer to in the book. Yeah. And I said, okay, I'm done. It's all about race. I don't need to read anymore. And then I read your book, and I was wrong. I was so wrong. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you for bringing the feelings and the people and the places together in a perspective that I had not had before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say, I mean, just to say to Tony, may he rest in peace. He was a lovely person. I, I, I wish there's some stuff I could, you know, I wanted to fuss with him. I was so sad he passed. Um, uh, but there were, he was, yeah. So I love the idea that these could be companions. Thank you. Wave your hands in the air. <laughs> like they just, they just don't care. <laughs> if you if you want to see us, <laughs> you know, if you watch Actually, hip hop eat. moment. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking about Tony Horowitz too because I thought it was really interesting that the Confederates in the attic provoked you a little bit. Yeah. To get going, and I was wondering who the other authors were you were either using as models or thinking in terms of your audience. Wh whom yeah. did you visualize as your audience? Yeah, the most important is Albert Murray, South to a Very Old Place. I mean, that is the book that is the, the, the center in terms of motivation. Um, 73, I think it was published. 73, is that right? Yeah. Uh, um, and then uh, Sterling Brown's Southern Road is also important. Du Bois' um, Souls of Black Folk, um, in, in 1903, but the sort of, for him, you said, so part of the conceit is, okay, so Albert Murray's Alabaman um, by birth, and he go, returns from New York, but he goes through these places. Before he gets to back south, he's in New Haven, and he's in um, New York. So these places that I know and that are close to me, um, I'm sorry, this is getting like structurally oh. ab abstract, but, um, so this idea of returning to the South in that book after a transformation has taken place with Du Bois. Du Bois is from Massachusetts. As an adult, he goes to the South. And so I'm playing with the fact that the South is, is my home. 
I grew up in Massachusetts. I'm returning like Du Bois. I have a different lens, but he's also the intellectual who's the most direct inspiration. So I have all, of, so there's all these layers of people who I'm, I'm traveling with. And of course, Zora Neale Hurston is big. Um, uh, yeah, so there's, there's a bunch of them. Yeah, I wrote a little piece in The Atlantic that actually goes through some of them that is not hard to find. Thank you. Question. We got a question here. Right here. In the front. We want to give it up for our, our mic mover, working real yes. hard out here in these booths. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much for this amazing work. Thank you. Uh, with our students who are here from Oakwood, I've often said you need to read this book because it reframes the South. It frames it on the one hand as perpetrator, but also as scapegoat for the country. It, am I being fair when I say that? Yes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and saving I'm, grace. Please? And, and saving, saving grace. And saving grace, and saving grace. So thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned Albert Murray. And there's a statement, you, you quoted him in the chapter on Alabama, and of course, we won't push back against all these wonderful things that are happening in South Carolina, um, because when you come to Alabama, you'll be able to talk about Alabama as much as you've talked about South Carolina. Um, so, but, but that said, th there was a statement that as I was reading your book, it just, I said, wow. In, in my life, having traveled to more than 60 different countries, this statement caught me. So I'll, I'll quote it, and I'd like to ask you to elaborate upon it. Albert Murray said, and this is in your chapter on Alabama, American culture, even in its most rigidly segregated precincts, is patently and irrevocably composite. But that's not the part that caught me. This part from Murray. The so-called black and so-called white people of the United States resemble nobody else in the world as much as they resemble each other. Would you unpack that? I mean, that's <laughs> profound. <laughs> yeah. So I want to elaborate a little bit because when, because I think it's true and also when Toni Morrison reviewed South to a Very Old Place, she was very critical of Albert Murray, and part of it was she said, he didn't go to places souther, meaning to the Caribbean, and didn't understand the connection that black Americans have with Africans. Both are right. We are crossroads people, mm. right? And um, there is something to be learned, I think, about the human condition out of the fact that that's true, right? Um, that we, you know, I mean, this is why I have the sections in the book that seem like sort of asides, but about the rhythm of our speech, the sort of slight distinctions between black and white Southerners, but a similar sensibilities, the, 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 the intimacy that coexisted with so much injustice and violence, right? That reality, um, there's possibility it exists there, but it would have to be, it has to go with the establishment of trust and deep integrity for that intimacy to actually turn into something that could be a model for, you know, human flourishing across the lines of difference, right? We're not there yet, obviously. Um, but, so I, so, so I think what Murray was saying is, was true, but he also neglected how much we're connected to other people of African descent, right? But he, but, but he was making a point. He was making an argument. He was rejecting the, he was, Murray was very critical of the black power movement, right? He was like, and he was, you know, which I don't, you know, Albert Murray and I didn't, I wouldn't say, like, we never met. I wish I had. I think we probably would have disagreed politically, but he is, I describe him, intellectually speaking, as my tar baby. He is, I am always stuck to him. <laughs> Stuff that he said is always affecting me. Always. You know, he just is so influential on my thought. And so, um, but I think we can, we can, um, we can understand his, he, his refu he didn't want to give up this place. This is home, right? That I deeply identify 
with, this, um, a sense of belonging, right? I, yes, it's home. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Because if not, I got questions. Oh, we got a question in the back. And then I'll take the closing question. So W.E.B. Du Bois, um, he discusses the double consciousness of black people yeah. in the souls of black folks. And I was wondering while you were deconstructing and examining different elements of the South, um, if you have any new insights or thoughts about the identity of black Southerners and how that double consciousness plays into our uh, roots. Oh, that's a brilliant question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so Du Bois is, so double consciousness um, uh, is Du Bois's, you know, concept for those who aren't familiar, this idea of when he describes it as for black Americans always feeling one's two-ness, being two warring souls in one body, being both black and American simultaneously, right? And a piece of that is to see oneself from the position of being black in this context, the particular insights that come from that, and also understanding what the dominant society sees of you. What's so gorgeous about it is he describes it as a veil, and it comes out of um, black folk uh, uh, spiritual practices, the, uh, the idea that if a baby is born with a veil or a call across its face, that that baby can see ghosts throughout their life. It gives you an offer. And he uses the language he talks about being gifted with second sight. This is not something that Du Bois knew from growing up in Massachusetts. Mm. Right? This is something that he learns when he comes, goes to Tennessee and Georgia. And so there's something about that for him, his identity comes through as a, as a, not just as a black person, but as a black intellectual comes through witnessing what life is like for black people in the South, right? What does it mean to have to, to know one's own position in history and culture, but also to be responsible, not just for knowing that of the dominant society, but also tending to the children such that you're actually socializing those who are in the dominant position, right? And that, so that, I think part of the genius of Du Bois is as opposed to simply rendering that as, um, you know, as a form of oppression, he understands the cognitive sophistication, the intellectual brilliance that was required to occupy that position, you know, to see outside and inside simultaneously and use it as an asset for the development of his ideas. And I, so for me, that becomes the model. Right? So when you, when you tap into what the folk know, right? what people know, um, and, and bring that to the life of the mind, I think you get incredibly um, um, meaningful right? possibilities in your work. I think that's also part, and that's the brilliance of Morrison too. You know, she did the same thing. Yeah. Her people from Alabama. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I have a, one of my doc students was from Birmingham, Alabama, and her uh, Twitter and handle is Black Girl South. And yeah. so I, I love sitting in the space with people from Alabama um, <laughs> because they keep me on my toes. Those and folks from Louisiana, um, as well as people from home. But I want to say thank you for that. And before we leave, yeah. um, I did want to ask a question about this is a big project. Mm. like. Literally, of your books, it's the biggest one on my shelf, <laughs> right? How did you feel in writing this book, but also how did you feel when you finally were finished with this text? Oh, I was exhilarated when I was writing it because I felt like finally someone is just letting, these people are going to let me write the book I want to write fully, <laughs> right? Like I was just, I mean, it just, you know, um, it's my seventh book. Yeah. And, and, and I, I felt, I, you know, I have very strong emotions about every project, but there was a kind of freedom here mm -hmm. that meant so much to me. And, I, and when I finished it, it, I don't know quite how to say it besides feeling like, okay, I did something that I was put here to do. Um, yeah. And so, I, you know, that was really good. I felt good. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you both. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. This was a very special presentation, not only for the substance of what we heard today, but because we, of the community support that we received from a number of sources, including the Mayor's Book Club, Oakwood University, the South Carolina Humanities Council, we've been able to bring this to the community free of charge and are streaming it not only through OM Radio, but uh, to historic black colleges all over the South. So this is a marvelous occasion. I want to remind everybody that Dr. Perry's book is for sale behind us here, and please buy Thank copiously. Thank you.